All right. Hello, everyone. Welcome to today's session or this month's session of Ask an Expert. Today, we'll be talking about Platform Designer. Uh, we bring our seasoned expert, Stephen Strell, who will be um, moderating or not moderating. Sorry, he will be he'll be the expert uh, doing questions. And, and I know he's got some uh, uh, I know he's, he's got some uh, presentation slides on some new features that uh, that maybe you all are, are not uh, aware of. Um, all right. Next slide, please. All <laughs> so right. I just so, wanted to do you yes, want to go ahead, Steve? Yes. OK, I just wanted to uh, put this in here because it's been uh, for people who have maybe attended before or if you want to tell your friends, uh, we've been doing these Ask an Expert sessions now for three years officially. Um, the first one was in November of 2020 and we did platform designer. So um, if you like what we do, we're going to try to keep doing it. We, we might change things around next year. We're not quite sure yet, but uh, we're celebrating three years of Ask an Expert. So I think I'm, uh, we're, we're pretty proud of that. Steve, do you want to introduce me? Yes, I will. <laughs> or should I just Absolutely. introduce myself? I, I, no, no, I'd, I'd be happy to introduce you, Steve. Thank so, you. Steve's my colleague. We, we, are, we are both on the trading team, and uh, we've been doing the Ask an Expert sessions, you know, Steve said, for three years. He he manages it and, and heads it up. I uh, are participate and and help uh, as needed, and I'm usually, usually on the call. Uh, most, most months I'm on the call with this. Uh, so Steve is uh, a veteran FPGA guy, uh, been with Intel, um, Let's see, been with Intel for 18 years, trading team for 16 years. Uh, he's he's done a wide variety of classes and a wide variety of online trainings that we have. And so he, he's definitely uh, very knowledgeable about uh, about all things FPGA related uh, when it comes to Intel and, and Cordis and, and whatnot. He's, he's taught classes on, on Cordis, on timing, platform designer, OpenCL, um, and, and the, and the list goes on. external external memory lately is that's right yes ex, yeah. external external memory partial configuration he's done trading on that as well yeah. um so yes so he's he's uh, he's been around a while so like i said he's uh, he's definitely uh, definitely very knowledgeable about uh, fpga type questions and uh there there is his email right there steven at yeah. um and that's uh, exactly he, what i look like still Yes, he does. I've, I've seen him, and uh, he still, <laughs> still still looks still looks like I that. I still look just like that, even though that picture is. I don't want to say how old it is, but anyway. <laughs> <laughs> Let's see. So I am Steve Elzinga. I will be your moderator. Um, so there's, uh, as I mentioned before, there's there's a. Uh, um, you can ask questions using the audio if you want to. Just go ahead and unmute yourself. Uh, if you don't have anything to to ask or or to comment about, just if you wouldn't mind, just keep yourselves on mute. That way you can minimize any background noise and uh, you know get rid of uh, any unnecessary distractions. Um, so you can uh, ask through audio or you can ask through the chat window. So while Steve will be presenting, he'll be focusing on his presentation materials or, or answering the questions. I'll be monitoring the chat window. So I have. Um, uh, I have multiple monitors where uh, where that uh, will not be a problem at all. Um, let's see. Um, yes. Okay. So uh, so so just, uh, yeah. Go, go ahead. Tell me. You'll just tell me the questions. As I will. Go. I will tell. I will tell Steve the question. Yes. Yeah. Um, next slide, please. Yeah. Uh, so ground rules. So anything you think about uh, platform designer, you know, it's fair game. Um, uh, hopefully, Steve will be able to answer. It. Good chance you will. If if the question ends up getting a little bit too involved. Uh, he may defer the topic uh, and, and may defer to uh, a local FE or, or something like that. Uh, you know, we don't mind uh, getting questions about your know, design related issues, uh, but since it is uh, design related, we, we might not have the full scope as to uh, what we could uh, what could be going on. But but Steve will uh, do his best to answer the questions. Um, so hopefully we don't have to defer the question uh, yeah. to an FE or, or try to answer it later. But anyway, that's, we'll, those, those are the we'll ground rules. Yep. Yes. All right. Thanks, Steve. Yes. Um, so welcome everybody to our Ask an Expert session. So just, I, I, you know, and of course, Steve, anytime a question comes up, just please feel free to interrupt me. Um, so just, I have a few slides. It's just kind of like to spur some stuff. And also I'm gonna be showing off some, some new stuff, but in general, I always like to start off these sessions with why you're here. So why you intrepid folks got the email registered and you actually came on. Um, maybe you just started learning about Platform Designer and you have questions about the tool, you're a new user. Uh, maybe you're in the process of using the tool, you started using it already, and uh, you're seeing something that you don't understand, completely understandable. There's a lot to Platform Designer. Uh, I don't know how to do what I think I need to do. Maybe you just don't know the flow or what steps to take or what to click, you know, that sort of thing. 
uh, or you're just stuck, which I've heard a lot. <laughs> so um, that's why you're here. Any questions you can think of about Platform Designer. Um, you also might be interested in hearing about some of the new features. Like I said, we usually use use these, these sessions as a way of, of showing off some of the new stuff that might be useful to you, uh, while also highlighting older stuff as, as discussed. Um, but then I always add at the bottom, you still call the tool to QSYS. So it hasn't been called QSYS since 2016 or 2017, and people still call it QSYS. And I just want people to know that it's, it's not called QSYS anymore. It's called Platform Designer. So anyway, um, I also like to start off with uh where you can go for self-help so of course we only have this is one hour once a month that you can come and ask questions but if you need assistance there's plenty of resources available on the intel homepage, and i'd just like to highlight the easiest way to get to those things so chances are you are some type of developer so don't go to support <laughs> <laughs> you can go to support, but it's a little trickier to find what I'm going to highlight. Go to developers, and then right there is resources and documentation and learn. And under resources and documentation, the quickest, you know, there's links right here to FPGA related stuff and, of course, directly to the Cordis Prime software documentation. Uh, and then if you go down to learn and you scroll a little way down, we're about uh, a quarter of the way down the page, you can find Intel FPGA technical training. And this gets you to our course catalog where you can sign up for an instructor led class or an e learning that you can go through on uh, your own time. So easy to get to those resources. There's, there's, surprisingly easier to get to than through support. Uh, so Steve throughout is going to be posting links in the chat. Um, I've supplied him with all the links that are in these slides because obviously you can't click on a slide in a presentation like this. Uh, so you'll be able to get quick access to all the stuff that I'm going to show off. So uh, first links, very important access to the user guides for platform designer. So you really want to have either the downloaded PDF copy or use the web based version of the guides, which are much, much better than they used to be. <laughs> I actually use the web version now instead of the PDF version. It's it's gotten much, much better. So check those out for the live and standard edition or the pro edition. All right. Steve, are there any questions or anything before I, I dive into some of the, the new features in Platform Designer? Nothing has come up yet. Okay. All right. Uh, again, please put your questions in. This is really what we want to do. We want to be able to help you out. If you have any questions or any thoughts at all about Platform Designer, please feel free. So let's get started. So there's been two big new features that have come out in Platform Designer this year, 2023. And the first one has to do with board and IP presets and the board aware flow. So the idea here is uh, is pretty simple and it's surprising that we haven't had it for a while is the idea that you want to make sure that your system design in platform designer will and, and all the IP that's in your system design will work correctly with the board that where your FPGA is going to live. Okay. So normally when you create a Cordis project, you are targeting a device and then you build a system design, but then, you know, you have to make your IO pin assignments later on. So there's a process here of setting up the design, you know, adding components to the system and then doing your IO assignments later and making sure that all that is correct. And this is usually, you know, you, you create this particular project, this design, but then you can't really easily reuse this design for other designs. Um, so instead of focusing on design reuse, this new feature that I'm going to talk about is basically board reuse. Basically, you have a board design where your FPGA lives and you know all the, the pins and what is going to be available and how you connect things up. And so we're going to have our systems target the board instead of just targeting a particular design. And that way we can easily create new projects, new designs in the future that target the same board and we don't have to worry about board compatibility is this pin in a different you know different location or whatever because of course a board is fixed 
It doesn't change over time. So while an FPGA does. So the idea here is that we can take advantage of that by creating board and IP presets. So starting in 22.4 and later, we have what we call the board aware flow. So when you are creating your Cordis project or at any time after you've created your project, instead of just targeting a particular device like you may be used to, you target a board, a particular board. And as we'll see, these boards are, you know, some boards come with the Cordis Prime software, or you can, you know, or you can add more for more dev kits that come out, or for a custom board, you could create a, uh, a board uh, file that we'll talk about in a moment that lives, that can stay and live in Cordis that you can access at any time for any future projects. So when you target a board, you add parameterize and connect your IP using board specific presets, meaning that the IP has parameters, all, has a preset for its parameters that are all set up to work with that particular board. So this saves you a lot of time. You don't have to go and make pin assignments. You can take the existing presets and adjust them if needed, or you can just stick with what's already in the preset and then you're basically done. So this can save you a lot of time and makes it much easier to reuse the board that you're working on with a different project. So you can see here, I've got a number of connections and the pin assignment. So this isn't in the pin planner, as I'll show you, this is actually in platform designer. So we set these up in a preset in platform designer so that those pin assignments are all ready to go for you. So let's say you have a dev kit already. Um, you know, and you want to make use of this. This is the overall flow that we're going to be talking about. So you'll create your system design as usual in Platform Designer, and you'll choose a board. A board information is stored in a board.xml file. And I'm going to show you how you can create your own for a custom board in a little bit. But if we have an existing board like a dev kit, Cordis comes with a number of board.xml files for these dev kits. So you can just choose the board in the new project wizard or even after you've started creating your system. When you choose a board file, it includes, or it may include, most of them do, it includes IPs that have presets for that board. So you would instantiate those IPs with those presets. And the interfaces, the connections of those IP get auto exported. They, so they become available and connected directly to the IO pins of the board as it's already been defined. Uh, any IO related assignments that are required like the pin locations or IO standards or whatever are automatically passed to the project from that. And this information again was coming from that board.xml file. So you don't have to go into the assignment editor. You don't have to go into the pin planner. You might want to to verify things, but these assignments will get auto set up in Cordis for you for that particular board and then you just compile your design. So the way that this works is through these board.xml files and these files define all the basic information about a particular board or dev kit. Uh, the board name, the targeted device, the specific targeted device on that board, and there's a versioning. So you can kind of think of it like a hardware.tickle file. So hardware.tickle is the script that's created for IP components in Platform Designer to define their properties. Okay, so it's kind of like a it's a board description file instead of a component description file like a hardware.tickle file is. Now, where do you get these board.xml files? Again, there are a number included with the Cordis Prime software installation. You can download from the FPGA design store. And this is one of the links that, uh, that Steve will be able to put in the chat. Um, so you can download uh, board files from the design store. And of course, you can also create your own custom board. Okay. And with each board.xml file, as I mentioned, there might be presets available for IP to work with that board design. Those presets come in a separate file called a QPRS file. This is a Cordis preset file. And this is um, this has been in Cordis and Platform Designer for a while where you can manually create a preset and save it as a QPRS file and then use it later. 
but the idea is that these preset files are already created for you and are will work with a particular board.xml file. Okay. Steve, any questions uh, in the chat or anything so far? Uh, so, so one question came up, but I think I think it's 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 a little bit off topic right now. Um, okay. The okay. but but it talked about you know the differences between standard and pro. Okay. The uh, um, so I guess specifically yeah what what are the differences between standard and pro platform designer? Ah uh, yeah, well, I probably should have prefaced this discussion that all this is in pro, not <laughs> not standard. Um, so there are a number of different. Specific, I presume it's the question is particularly between uh, platform designer and standard and pro. Um, but there's a number of differences. The basic use of the tool between standard and pro is the same. Um, you still use a .qsys file, you add components, uh, you build up your system design uh, by adding components and making connections. Um, you can set up memory maps so that components can communicate with each other in the system. Um, most of the basic flow between pro and standard or standard and pro is identical. Um, and when I teach my class, I always bring that up right up front. There are a few important behind the scenes differences, as well as a few additional features just like this that are available in pro that are not available in standard. Um, so, for example, one of the biggest differences is the way that components work. So I have a picture of a system design somewhere here. No, well, I may as well switch over to the, the tool. It's easier to just show that off. So, so this is what a system design in, in, in platform designer looks like. Um, but one of the things to important differences between standard and pro is that in pro, the components, so each of these is a component. And each component is basically its own separate entity. Um, it has its own separate file called a .ip file that defines all of the information about that component. Um, and that .ip file is separate from the main .qsys file. So this is a .qsys file that I'm working in. Um, and the idea to, by separating the IP, the components from the QSIS, we can have development of the interconnect, which is defined in the QSIS file, and development of the individual IP separate from each other. And this provides a lot of advantages for building a system, uh, being able to customize individual components without affecting the rest of the system design. Um, there's many, many benefits to having these in their have their own separate .ip description files. Um, that's the biggest difference. And as far as features are concerned, there's a, a number of features that are different that I don't think I really have time to go into right now. But I wanted to highlight the the, the difference in how these are actually implemented. You'll notice here when I do go over to have a tooltip over a component, it says it's a generic component. And you might be thinking, uh, no, that's a parallel I.O. But in the pro edition, which is what this is, all components are basically generic components. And the .ip file describes what's inside that generic component. Think of it like a black box that's filled in with information from the .ip file. So um, whereas in standard, all that information is mishmashed together in a single .qsys file. So whenever you make a change, you have to completely regenerate, recompile the system. Um, it can take a lot longer, whereas working in Pro, because of this separation, things can go a little bit faster and, and you have advantage of some additional features. So I have no idea if that answered the question, but uh, there you go. Yes, well, it, it did definitely address you know, the differences between standard and Pro. There are a couple more follow-up questions. Um, sure. I'll, I'll just go uh, one by one here. The uh, can we use Neos five in Cortis standard? Neos five in Cortis standard. Ooh, um, I believe that support was recently added, right, Steve? I, I'm I'm not a Neos five expert um, yet. <laughs> I'm working on that you, one. Um, you know, I I, I, just I added. I thought it was, but uh, let me let me double check with that. Let's let's yeah, go ahead and move on to the next on question. While I'm, yeah, well, yeah, let's I'm move pretty, on to the next I'm question. I'm pretty sure that at first Neos Five was not supported in standard, but in I think in one of the recent, I think in the update this year, 
it was added, and if not, it's going to be coming up in in the first, you know, the first release of twenty of twenty twenty four. So, but I'm I'm pretty sure it was added this year. Yeah, I'll I'll, I'll double check here. Uh, next yeah. question is, uh, can we mix our own HDL code with IP block to create a system? Yes, you can create. I, I'm guessing the question is is related to custom components. So yes, you can create your own custom components that are based off of your own HDL code. Uh, right here in the IP catalog, there's the new component option, and that opens up the component editor where you build up a custom component pointing to your HDL files for uh, synthesis and optionally add files that would be used during simulation. So yes, you can certainly mix, mix off-the-shelf IP with your own HDL-based IP. Great. Yep. And then one, one more, yeah, one more follow-up question. Um, I guess it uh, came as a result of you showing the system there. What, what are with the, the little colored dots inside there, the, the black <laughs> and blue dots? So that's a relatively new feature. Um, so in, and again, this is in pro only, um, but the, um, the dots are just to indicate what's happening at, for that particular connection. Um, and they indicate when there is additional logic inserted to make that connection happen. So, um, you know, when you click a dot, you're basically making a connection between the interfaces. Remember, each of these are referred to as interfaces. So they could, in, an interface in Platform Designer is made up of either a single signal or it could be a bundle of multiple signals. So when you click one of these dots or right click and make a connection any, in any way, um, you're making a connection and it may just be wires. So for example, the black dot here, that just shows that it's a wire connection because it's a clock signal, nothing, nothing fancy there. The clock is coming from this clock source and it's going into this clock input. And if I hover over the dot, the tooltip tells me exactly that. Now, if you see a different colored dot, a blue dot, then that's an indicator that to make that connection work, it's not just wires, but that platform designer is going to insert additional logic to make that connection happen. And the tooltip explains, uh, usually explains why, why this is going to be required. Um, so in this example, uh, this is a reset connection and it says the reset sync is fed by multiple reset, oops, fed by multiple reset sources. So it's going to need to add a reset adapter in there to handle the multiple sources. So things like that, it's just meant to provide you with, with, uh, with information that logic is going to be inserted in there. Um, we used to not, these used to all be black dots and you'd only see the coloring if, uh, if you turn on certain filtering options. Um, but uh, the blue dots now are just to remind you that logic will be inserted there. There's nothing wrong with the design. Um, it's just providing you information. So. Anything else, Steve? All right. Uh, nothing else for now. I'm, I'm still okay. uh, trying to figure out the, the NILS 5 and Cortis standard. So, okay. um, <laughs> yes, I'll, I'll let you know when I, when I get that answer. Okay. Sounds good. So, going back to board files. Um, so you can choose a board to target in a number of different ways. Like I said, you can do it when right at the beginning when you're first creating your project in the new project wizard, or at any time if you go into the device settings under the assignments menu in Cordis, of course, normally you select your device um, on the device tab here, but you can switch over to the board tab and specify a device to filter and look for available installed boards. Okay, so you'll select a board and then that that board.xml file will be used for the duration of you working with this design. Um, so when you create a platform designer system, it will bring over that board setting. If you did not set this in Cordis, then you can set it in platform designer itself. So you can go to the, um, in the IP, uh, I'm sorry, in platform designer, there is now a new board tab and that shows you the boards from the board.xml files and you'll notice it also shows you a number of IP. These are IP presets that come with the board file that you can use to easily add that IP to your design and have it already set up for the board that you've selected. Okay. You can set the board to use in the system settings. So let me jump back to Cordis here. 
or I'm sorry, back to platform designer. And if I go down to system settings here, you'll notice that uh, well, it's an Agilex 7. I, well, I don't know why Stratix 10 board is selected, but I'll switch that. So I could switch over to, you know, one of the Agilex F series development kits here. And that you'll notice that changes it in platform designer and it changes it to the appropriate device in my Cordis project. So if I flip over to Cordis, 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 Cordis. Um, the device has now changed. You're not going to go through that, but it matches now what's in Platform Designer. So now this is set in both Platform Designer, the system, as well as in my Cordis project. Uh, and if I flip to the board tab here, you'll notice now it's the only thing listed there is the board that I selected. If I wanted to see other boards, I could change this to show all IPs, and then that shows all the other boards associate, uh, that are available, all the board.xml files I have available. But let's go back to the current settings, and then you can see that I've got these IPs below that I could add in, and they will already be pre-configured, pre-set up for this particular board. So, for example, you can even see that, you know, this dev kit has, um, has uh, multiple memory interfaces, and I can add the FPGA IP for EMIF that, that has that already set up for me. Um, there's even an option here for uh, Micron memory. So there's lots of, you know, you get a lot of advantages if you can choose a board, if you're working with a particular board. And you can also, like I said, create this for your own custom boards so that you can reuse your own board uh, going forward with this, uh, with this feature. Oops. All right. Well, we have uh, a nice little pause here. Uh, another question came up. Uh, question is, is uh, DE1 SOC available in the list? And so su suspect the, the question deals with, you know, can you develop uh, for the DE1 board uh, through Platform Designer, you know, with the with the um, uh, the embedded processor there and everything? Uh, one? <clears throat> you mean with the yeah. HPS? Uh, yeah, well, that's a Cyclone yes. Five. That's 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 quite old. Um, it is. Cyclone yeah. Five is not supported in uh, in Pro. Um, so for that particular board, no, this this feature would not be available. If you created, um, yeah, and and that would have to be in standard as well. So this feature would not be available for any Cyclone Five uh, Cyclone Five device. Um, but you can't if if your device is supported in Pro you can create a custom board.xml file for it. So now in both standard and pro, you can create presets manually. So this is the presets tab. Um, so you could create presets um, that could be reused, but the whole board.xml um, overarching structure that has these associated presets with it, that doesn't exist in standard and, and would not work with a DE1. All right, thank you. And uh, as far as NEOS 5 support in standard, it is supported. So specifically, the version of NEOS is NEOS uh, 5, uh, the M uh, version. That that got support in the standard 22.1. Um, I actually reached out to a colleague of mine to uh, to verify that, and that's that's what she said. Uh, hopefully, we'll be able to. One. That's the that's the smallest Neos that's, five. That's right? the smallest one, right? Yeah. Um, more support is uh, for Neos five is coming next year in standard, and uh, she uh, she's looking for a link to to provide provide us with. So if there's a link that comes in available, I'll, I'll go ahead and pass. Uh, sorry, perfect. paste it in the chat window. Perfect, perfect. Thanks, Steve. Any other questions at this point? Uh, nothing right now. Okay. All right. So. Um, like I said, with a board file, you get, uh, you may get presets that come along with it, these QPRS files, okay? Um, so like I said, presets have been available in Platform Designer, but now not only do they include, so, so previously what a preset file did for you was it preset the parameters for an IP. So if I select a, you know, if I were to select a, um, a preset here, what it would do is it would set the parameters appropriately for that particular component. So I wouldn't have to go through and click through and set all the parameters here. That's what a preset did up till now. So what we have now, we've extended what a preset file does that it can include 
IO related information in the preset, and then that can be passed back over to Cordis. Okay, so what it can be included in a QPRS file now. So you can have pin location information, you can have IO standard information, you can have exported interface signal names for easy top level pin assignment. Now, like I said, it comes with the pin assignments, but you can make changes from the preset if you need to. Okay, you're not locked into what the preset is using, but the preset is designed for the particular board. Okay. To help manage this in Platform Designer, there's a new Exported Interfaces tab that lets you see these presets and adjust them. So let me go back to Platform Designer and, oh, I already have it open here. So this shows me a list of all the interfaces that have been exported out of this design that will either need to be connected to the rest of my Cordis project or in most cases directly to top level IO pins. Okay. And so I don't think I've set any of these up yet. Yeah, I didn't set any of these up, but yeah, unfortunately. Um, but let's see if I use this uh, F series FPGA dev kit preset and I apply it. that's going to do anything probably not because I didn't set this up yeah yeah it's not set up in here okay not a great demo <laughs> wait oh yeah, I can show you this all right here we go so um, this is a uh, four bit output for LEDs and when I applied this preset um, you can see down below here the parameters that were set up with the preset you, they're all grayed out because they're they're based off the preset. But then there's this new section that's available that shows the pins. Okay, so it indexed the signal since this was a four bit bus and it was able to from the preset select pin locations to connect to LEDs. Okay, um, so this is all set up and then this will, like I said, get passed over to Cordis and will show up in the pin planner eventually once I uh, save and generate this. So this is the advantage of presets and the added feature of presets that has been added with this new board aware flow. Okay. So if I turn that off, there's other presets here for other kits, but for the select board. Okay. So um, yeah, and you can edit these if you want to, but this makes it much, much easier to make sure that your IP in your system design are configured correctly to work with the selected board. Okay. Um, it becomes part of the QIP file after you uh, generate the system. Any, qu any other questions come up, Steve? Yes, uh, another question. Um, what about migrating a platform designer system from standard to pro? What's, what's, what's involved with that? Um, so uh, yeah, so this is this is an important topic, especially now with uh, Agile X5 coming out shortly. Um, Agile X5 is our new low to mid range product, and uh, we foresee that a lot of people will be migrating their older Cyclone 5 designs to Agile X5. Uh, so that will be a transition from standard to pro. Um, as far as going from standard to pro in platform designer is concerned, there's really not much you have to do. Um, you'll be able to, if you have an existing project um, and uh, you try opening it in pro, uh, a standard project and opening it in pro, it'll tell you, okay, this device is not compatible. You'll have to select a new device, but then it's all basically automated for you. So it will, um, you know, you, you'll, you'll, you know, the, the, the Cordis project will transition to a pro project and then the platform designer system will be upgraded, so to speak, to the pro uh, to the pro edition. Um, it will create the IP, the dot IP files for you automatically. It's, it's mostly a behind the scenes thing as far as platform designer is concerned. So the key thing will be that you'll have to change the target device, obviously, because Cyclone 5 is not supported or a previous device is not supported in pro. Um, but we make it pretty easy, as easy as possible. Um, if you still need the standard project and standard system design, of course, you'd want to back that up before you open it in pro. But uh, it's really just a matter of opening it in pro. It'll give you a warning and, and it'll, it'll convert it for you. So pretty easy. Anything else?
uh, that's it for right now. Thank you. Okay. So, um, so that's how you use the presets and the board files. There's also, what if you want to create your own custom board.xml file? So you can create a board file from scratch or base it off an existing system design. You have to provide details about the board, save the file, and then just go into the user flow that I was just talking about to select and use it. In order to create a board file on the board tab in the IP catalog, similar to how you create a new component, if I go over to the board file here, I could just click new and that opens up the new board dialog box. And then I just need to fill in the information in order to create a new board.xml file. It's very, very easy. So there's two key options in this dial in this dialog. So enable board generation that must be turned on in order to create a new board.xml. So you might be wondering, well, why would I ever turn that off? You may, might just want to be creating presets and not a board.xml file. So you could turn that off and leave enable system preset generation turned on to create a system wide presets file. Um, or vice versa, you could have this one turned off and board generation turned on to create just the board.xml file and no presets. It's up to you. Um, obviously you wouldn't want to have both of these turned off because that wouldn't do much of anything. Um, but you're going to create your board.xml file and optionally your uh, board presets file. Now, um, so this is doing it from platform designer. You can also, if you have a design already that has pin assignments, instead of doing everything in platform designer, you can start in Cordis and then migrate those pin assignments into platform designer. So I can go to, where is it? Under file here, I'm not gonna do it, but there's a new option called load pin from Cordis project. And when I do that, that is going to import all the pin assignments that I already have in my Cordis project, and that will become part of the board.xml and the presets. So you can go from platform designer back to Cordis or from Cordis to platform designer with this. Very, very useful. Uh, once you've created the board.xml file, you can then create individual. So this is a global presets for the board, but you can create individual preset files for IP. So you'll parameterize the IP, create a new IP preset, a QPRS. And the new thing is the third step here, the fact that you can create IO related assignments directly in the preset, which you could not do previously. So this is the preset dialog. And the new, the new thing is this pin assignments tab. The parameter settings tab has been there forever. That's just setting parameter options for the IP. But in the pin assignments tab now, you can select a particular signal for this component and set a pin location and IO standard for it. Okay. So again, you could do this from scratch or bring it in from Cordis and go in that direction instead of the other direction. So the presets get associated with the selected board file. So um, da, 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 yeah, so here's our preset file. And since we're, the assumption is that we've already got a, a board set here. And so this will get, so when these assignments will get associated with the board.xml file. All right, so that's it. There's a couple of YouTube videos you can check out. Um, some of my colleagues um, have created, uh, I believe these are quick, your quick videos, Steve, about, uh, about this flow. I forget if they're quick videos or longer videos, but uh, uh, these videos go over a lot of what I just covered, shows you an actual demo going through the whole process. So you can check those out as well. And those should be in the links that Steve will post. Any questions coming up, Steve, or anything else? The uh, so question question that came up: What what standards are used for the uh, IP connections inside the system? St like standard interfaces? Yeah, standard interfaces. I think. Oh, that's oh, referring to. okay. So, platform designer supports um, two main 
types of two well there's there's multiple you know unique standard interfaces like clocks and resets and things like that but those are pretty simple just a few signals the main standard interfaces are avalon and axi uh, from arm and so avalon altera and intel have used forever it's a very simple uh simple protocol for transferring data um very simple uh, control signals for managing the flow of data. And then you've got AXI, which we introduced in Platform Designer when we started uh, having our um, hard processor system devices, our SOC devices that include a hard processor to be compatible with ARM CPUs. And um, AXI, or AXI as a lot of people like to call it, uh, has lots more controls, many, many more options available um, for data transfer, burst management, uh, security, things like that are just embedded in the interface specification. And in Platform Designer, you can uh, they can communicate together. So you can connect AXI interfaces with Avalon interfaces and Platform Designer will insert all the logic needed to make those connections happen. Uh, makes it very, very useful and compatible uh, with a large number of designs. Um, Axi is we're, we're, we've been putting out more IP that are Axi based than Avalon lately. Um, Avalon is still supported, but uh, there's I've noticed that there's been more more Axi activity. For example, our latest um, external memory interface IP uh, for Agile X7 and the upcoming Agile X5 are all Axi 4 based uh, natively. So that is for performance reasons. Um, and you know feature reasons as well. Um, Axie is, has has many more features and can get higher bandwidth than Avalon can. So that's why we've 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 done that for certain IP. So you can design with either because they'll both work in Platform Designer. But uh, Axie right now is the the higher bandwidth choice. Any other questions there, Steve? Yeah, another question, um, and I, th I think this was from uh, an astute uh, participant here. I, I don't remember you uh, mentioning this in the presentation. Um, it's, uh, the differences between the uh, .IP and .QIP files. Oh, yeah, so real quick. So I mentioned earlier .IP. So .IP, those are the files that are in pro that, uh, that define individual components in a system. A QIP file has been around a lot longer. That's a Cordis IP file. And what that is, is a file that you add to your Cordis project that points to all the files that make up an IP. So an IP can be made up of dozens or even hundreds of files. And it would be a real pain in pain. I was going to use a bad word. <laughs> it could be a real pain to, uh, <laughs> to add all of those files to your Cordis project. So now instead, when you generate a Cordis IP, it generates a single QIP file that points to all those files. So all you have to do is add that one file to your Cordis project. Uh, when you generate a platform designer system, you can add a QIP file from the generated system to your Cordis project that points to all the files that make up the system. Okay. Um, you don't have to worry about that too much in pro. It does it all for you automatically, but in standard, you do need to add either the QIP file that's generated from the system or the .qsys file itself. The system that gets uh, that uh, the system itself should, needs to be added to the project so that, to make that association in pro. That's all done for you behind the scenes. So. The, I guess I guess a follow up with that then is uh, what are the advantages of using a .qip or a .qsys to your course project? So again, this only matters with standard. In pro, you don't make this choice. In in pro, it's it's smarter about regenerating your system. It will just reach since the components are all separate. It'll just regenerate something that has changed. Um, but in standard, if you add the QIP file to your project, then that's going to save you time during compilation because it won't need to regenerate your system. If you add the .qsys file to your project, then the system is going to need to be generated and it will get generated every time you compile your main Cordis project. That's the main difference. So that, uh, the, and just, just from my own curiosity, the, uh, when, you, when you add a .qsys, then regardless of uh, previous generations, it will regenerate that every single time? Every time you compile, yes. 
yes. Okay. All right. So if you've already generated your system manually in Platform Designer, it may, and you're not going to be changing the system, it makes much more sense to add the QIP file to your Cordis project than the .qsys to save that time. Great. All right. Any other questions? Don't, there's no other questions right now. Okay. So we're running out of time, but I really wanted to show this second big feature that was added this year of, um, of Platform Designer, which is subsystem packaging. So when you create a system in Platform Designer, you can create a, it, a hierarchical system. Basically, you have a top-level system design, and then you can have sub, what we call subsystems that can be added in. A subsystem can be a complete system that is added to an existing system. Um, now, to create subsystems, uh, there's, you know, basically there's been two ways that you would do this. You would create an empty subsystem and then manually add IP and make connections out of the subsystem to connect to the higher level system. Um, or in your higher level system, you could add components and make connections. And then there is a push down command in Platform Designer to create a new subsystem from the components that you've selected. Okay. And then you can use the archive system option to create a zip file that includes all the files for the systems and subsystems. So this is tedious. There's a lot of things to think about uh, and worry about when you go through this flow. So what we added on this year to Cordis is subsystem packaging. So instead of going through all that, you can create a single file. It's a .qcp file that contains all the files that make up the subsystem. So you can basically add a subsystem to your design, kind of like you add a component to the design. It's all packaged up in this QCP file, and there might be parameters for it, just like adding a component. So uh, you can use off the shelf uh, packages, or you can create your own. Okay. So the subsystem packages get added to the IP catalog. The QCP files are added just like any other components, and this is going to simplify file management and give you faster times for adding components, uh, adding these packages to your system. Now, the packages can be set up to be unlockable, so or they can be locked. A lock package means that the user is not able to go in and make changes to the subsystem, whereas if it can be unlocked, then you can basically turn it from a package into a standard system design that can be edited and customized. Okay. So for more details on this, and I'm going to show you more, but I just want to show that there's a new app note 1002. We got over 1000 app notes um, that goes into detail on the subsystem packaging feature. So what are the use cases for this? So maybe you got something from Intel we might make available to you designs that are packaged as these subsystem packages. So it may be made up of multiple IPs together in a subsystem. Or you can create your own custom subsystem. So, you know, maybe you created a CPU subsystem and you use it in multiple projects. You can turn it into a package and then reuse it in a future design. So this is what it looks like to create a package. So you've got your .qsys file. And if you want to create a .qcp file, you just click or double click new subsystem. And that will open up a dialog where you can configure this subsystem package. You can see what gets included in a QCP. So you've got the .qsys file. You've got all the .ip files that I was talking about. You've got a scripting file that has an ss.tickle extension. And then you can add any additional files that you want. Okay. So when you go to new subsystem, it looks like this. So you, it's very similar to configuring a custom component. Um, it shows you a list of the components in your system, and you can choose which components and which connections should be included in the package. Okay. So you can choose how this package should work when somebody reuses it. You can go to the additional files tab to add any other files that are needed. For example, if you have RTL code for custom components, you can switch over and add it there. And then save it as a .qcp file. Once you have a package available, 
And again, you can choose whether it's lockable, uh, unlockable or not. If it is unlockable, okay. Um, oh, wait, what am I showing here? Uh, da, 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 da. Oh, oh, okay, sorry. So if it is unlockable, and that should say, oh, I should retitle that. But anyway, so I have a subsystem package that's been added in. I would have changed that to say dot, dot uh, QCP instead. But anyway, when you unlock it, it would turn that uh, QC, yeah, that should be a dot QCP, not a dot IP. That's a typo there. Sorry about that. Um, when you unlock it, it turns it into a standard dot QSYS file, allowing you to edit it just like you normally would as a subsystem. Okay, so um, the unlocking feature allows you to turn it from this special package format into a standard system design. And I know I am running out of time here. Uh, so just going to go through a couple things real quick to make something to make a package unlockable. You go to the subsystem script. So the script lets you customize the package, even adding parameters that somebody can add in or can edit when they add the package to their system. But you can also add the unlockable option. It, uh, by default, uh, packages are not unlockable. So they're basically these things that a user would just add and they can't go in and make changes to it. This is what it looks like when you unlock a package. So you can see a lock package has a little zipper icon on it. And so I can unlock it and then it'll turn it into a standard subsystem. Um, but you cannot go in the opposite direction. Once it's unlocked, it cannot be turned back into a locked system. Now, if a uh, for whether or not a package is locked or not, you can always dive into the package. There's a right click command to do that. And you can take a look at what's going on inside the package. Maybe you have access to some parameters, but you might not have access to other parameters. But diving into a package allows you to take a look at what's going on inside, okay, without allowing you to actually change it. Okay, that's all the slides um, I've got. Uh, and I know we're running out of time. So Steve, are there any kind of went through that quickly, but are there any questions from anybody about that or anything else? No, uh, no questions came through during that time. Do you have any questions? <laughs> uh, no, I don't have any questions. I do have a comment. I did put the link to our survey. So if you wouldn't mind filling out the Perfect. survey, let us know how we did. Uh, that'd be uh, that'd be appreciated. Perfect. So you got the link and uh, all the other links in the chat there? Yep, we're, all, we're good there. All right. Okay, um, so that's really it. Um, you know, uh, again, we'll maybe hang on a second if there's if there's any questions about platform designer or this new package flow or anything else that we've discussed today. I am all ears and ready to to answer if there is anything coming up. Um, if you want to unmute your mic and ask something, you could do that as well. So, anything, Steve? Nothing, nothing's coming. Nothing's through. coming. Okay. All right. Well, um, so then I guess maybe we just call it. <laughs> what do you think, Steve? Should we call it? Uh, yes, I think so. Okay. All right. So thank you all for attending. Uh, Steve, as Steve mentioned, there'll be a link in the chat. Um, you'll also soon receive an email with the link as well as the YouTube link to be able to view the recording on YouTube of this session if you are interested in doing that. Steve, did you have any any comments? Uh, nothing, nothing else. Uh, just thank everyone for uh, for attending, and hope to see you all uh, the next session for Ask an Expert. Okay, let's get the last few slides, and then we'll end the recording.